All right. Okay. So thank you very much for joining us, Professor Parsons. Um, Chris Parsons uh, is Associate Professor of History. He teaches in the History Department. Uh, he teaches all sorts of things on early America and environmental history, um, which fit perfectly with his very, very um, well-known and well-respected research. Uh, he has a recent book called A Not-So-New World, Empire and Environment in French Colonial North America, um, which just came out in 2018 and won and was nominated for a whole bunch of awards. Um, and in this book, he talks about how uh, the, uh, the French who came to North America uh, both tried to bring their own environment with them from Europe and shape the new environment uh, to look like something where they had come. And in the process, used indigenous knowledge, used native knowledge. Um, and he makes an argument in, in his research more broadly that the history of science and botany um, and, and I suppose agriculture and the development of, of our understanding um, of how things grow and where um, should inc incorporate much more um, indigenous knowledge and indigenous um, history. And so he's really the, the perfect person um, to talk to us about uh, the early experience of settlement and interaction in Boston um, with the environment and with other people. Um, and uh, I now is the perfect time also to tell you about an exciting game we're going to play. So Professor Parson is holding up a mug. I don't know how well you can see it. I also have a mug. Can you see this? See this? This is some custom swag. So on this side, it says NUN History of Boston 2020. On this side, it's a screen grab of the History of Boston, a Birth of Boston site. It says the Birth of Boston and Christopher Parsons and the date. Do you get one of those? That's the question I History wanted to class. hear. So we have one. Can you buy the merch? That is also an interesting question. <laughs> Get a side gig. <laughs> I'll seek to profit from it. Uh, I'm not sure how the buying situation is going to work, but I did buy three. I did order three. And for each class, I'm going to order one for me. And I could actually often uh, always auction mine off at the end or something. One for me. There is genuine hot coffee in here. Um, one for our guests, so in this case, Professor Parson, Parsons, and one for um, uh, uh, for that will be earned by someone in the class. Does anybody anybody watch uh, or listen to? I should say the the um, weekend edition puzzle with Will Shorts. Anybody in this? Anybody here? <laughs> Um, you call it while you were muted. Anybody in this class uh, over the age of 50? Because I think I'm on the younger side of people who listen to the puzzle on, uh, on Weekend Edition. But in any event, we're going to do something similar to what they do there. Professor Parsons or whoever is doing the class or me will give a, um, a trivia, will ask a trivia question at the end of the class. Email me your correct answers and I will draw for the winner who will get the, the merch cup or uh, the, the custom cup for our given week. Is that fun? <laughs> Clap as if <laughs> my dad used to force me to listen to NPR. Now you do it voluntarily. Clap if you think that's fun. Yes. You guys didn't use those emoji claps? Is it just, oh, there we go. All right, all right. Hmm. The coffee is so much better when it comes in a custom mug. Um, all right, coffee maker. Yes, maybe, maybe at the end, maybe we'll sell them, raise money, and then, um, and then, and then uh, raffle off a coffee maker. Although not my espresso maker, because that stays with me. Um, all right. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to uh, Professor Pro uh, Professor Parsons, and I'm going to say for the chat, what I'm going to do is uh, and questions. I'll monitor, I'll monitor the chat so that Professor Parsons doesn't have to worry about it and get distracted by it. And if there's something like, 
really pressing, like I, I didn't, I didn't like, I didn't understand or comprehend something. Uh, only then will I um, cut in on Professor Parsons. Um, and otherwise I'll take notes and I'll, I'll ask him the questions that you've been asking at the end. Uh, does that make sense? All right, Professor Parsons. All right, thank you. So sorry about the technical difficulties. As I said, this is actually my first time doing one of these. And uh, of course, even though I've used Zoom a million times now, um, this is the day that it freaks out. So um, I actually really like teaching the history of Boston. Uh, I think probably more than many of the students I've had enjoy learning about it. Um, I am from uh, Western Canada originally, and so oddly enough, when you grow up um, in Calgary and go to university in Vancouver, the history of Boston and the history of the Puritans and that sort of stuff is not something that you do to a point that it's boring or you do to a de death or I never really had like that kind of infamous bad high school history teacher that everyone seems to have had at some point in their life. Um, so it was never ruined for me. Um, and at the same time, uh, one of the things I find really interesting is, uh, especially teaching the history of Boston in Boston, the version that I have learned or that I'm interested in is usually pretty different than what you folk have learned. And what you folk have learned, depending on where you're from in the US or the world, um, is also really uh, probably pretty different from each other. So I, I, it's, oh, it's been fun for me to kind of share versions of what the history of Boston looks like. I think most people think um, like, First Thanksgiving, giant belt buckle hats, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and that's a place to start, a place to work from. But I, one of the things that I've actually found interesting as I've, get, as I've gotten into it is it's actually surprisingly hard to teach or find out about in kind of new and interesting ways. If you want to know about uh, kind of a, that first Thanksgiving pilgrim version of it, you can find that, but to find different ways of telling about the history of the city of Boston in particular, it's kind of tricky. Um, f as you've no doubt done starting to explore Boston, uh, this is a city that tends to wear its history on its sleeve. Um, and if you kind of asked anyone, what sort of history does Boston really celebrate? You'd probably say early, colonial, these sorts of things, but it's actually really hard to find traces of Puritan Boston, like the really early Boston. Um, we could definitely find every little nook and cranny that took part in the American Revolution. If uh, George Washington um, stepped on a brick, there's probably a plaque somewhere. But if you want to know about the Puritans, it's actually hard. And I know this because when I first arrived, I was like, oh, this should be easy. And I started sending students out on scavenger hunts to find, I knew where there were plaques, I knew where there were mar uh, markers. And I asked students to find a couple of the um, important landmarks for like 1630s Boston, like the first moments of founding. And I asked them to uh, take a selfie at these places and send them to me just as kind of uh, thinking about where they were, what was around them. Um, so I asked for the first church um, called First Church. Um, and I asked for the, go the first governor's house. And then I asked for, um, as I'm going to talk about, the reason people the Puritans ended up coming to Boston was because it had a good source of water um, and where they had been before that was not the case um, dysentery sucks and so they came to Boston um, and so there's a plaque that memorializes what is called the Great Spring on Spring Street in downtown Boston um, this was the first time I did it what I found remarkable was I would get these pictures and I had no idea where students were um, and students went to Charlestown, Cambridge, Dorchester. Uh, I had no idea where they were going. Um, and the whole point was actually like you can get on a subway from Northeastern, go a couple stops, 
go to the old state house and like most of old Boston is around there. Um, but these people, many of whom actually had grown up in Boston had no idea how to find this history. And even if they were looking for it, it was really hard to find these, these plaques or these markers to kind of commemorate this history. Um, so I worked with some students in our department to uh, create, I'm gonna share the screen now to the birth of Boston, this map that a bunch of you should have looked at. Um, share. Um, which provides a sort of, uh, I don't wanna say it's comprehensive, um, but this was one of the earliest moments that I could find a record of not everyone who lived in Boston, but who was recorded as paying taxes in Boston or who showed up in the ledger books as having been given property. So of course that means that it skews uh, elite, it skews white, it skews male. Um, but once we got into more of the records, uh, there are a lot of people in the area who want to know what ship their ancestors came over on in the 1630s. There's whole institutions um, devoted to this. Um, there are still clubs in Boston that you can only join if your families came over on these ships. Um, I'm part of an organization that only allows those folks in and historians who uh, study and therefore tell them how great they are all the time. We meet every year in uh, a fancy club in Beacon Hill. Uh, so fancy that I didn't know about it. And when I Googled it, the big story that came up was that when there was a fire at this club, they actually made the firemen come in the service entrance. Um, so there's that sort of Boston. Um, but I was interested in getting more detail about who, who actually lived in Boston, who arrived, who made up for it. Um, because one of the things that interests me is we have this image of Puritan Boston, but there were a lot of other people there. And even beyond these governors, um, there are a lot of other faiths, a lot of other ethnicities, a lot of other ways of living and making Boston. Um, so we're gonna come back to this in a little bit. Um, one of the things I, if I was in person, what I'd invite is I want you to take a couple minutes right now and in the chat, take a couple minutes. And if you had to think of the first two or three words that kind of summarize what you think of as colonial Boston, the earliest moments of Boston, whether this is something you learned from um, looking at the birth of Boston, whether this is something you learned in school, um, just take, a, let's say three, four minutes right now and think a couple key words um, and throw them into the chat. Because um, I, I just want to kind of get a sense of where we are. And, uh, oh, these are, yeah, Puritans, Tidal Flats, uh, I'm going back and saying I'd buy the sweatpants, which threw me for a second. Um, Hills, Mayflower, Winthrop, Pilgrims. Huh, Miles Standish. That's a showing off some stamp act. Which is local. That's a local Miles saying Miles yeah. Standish. Puritans. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah. So, um, We'll come back to this map because I want to show you some of the other sorts of folks who, oh, Boston Common cow grazing, yeah. Um, all right, let me share my PowerPoint. Great answers, everybody. Yeah. All right. Can everyone see my PowerPoint? Okay. Yep. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is uh, we're going to have a kind of an agenda of three items. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the indigenous history of Boston and how, how we should talk about the founding of Boston. Um, because there's, we have to be careful how we talk about the founding, not just of Boston, but of a lot of these kind of colonial cities. Um, in a way that uh, has echoes of the first founders who were trying to naturalize their arrival and the founding of the city. Um, what I mean by this is there was a real, in the first moments, there was a real sense of um, celebrating 
God's will, God's providence, um, and so making this seem preordained um, that had way that had the impact of either erasing or undermining any sort of indigenous claim to this uh, to this region um, that naturalized the sense that this was going to be a Western modern spot and these indigenous people were belonged to a previous time or um, only belong in the history of the city rather than the present. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit more about the Puritans. Actually, this is a lot of you. Um, this is was my sense. Religious freedom, Puritans, John Winthrop, um, uh, religious freedom, city on a hill. Uh, these are all aspects of that we'll kind of get into to talk a little bit more about who the Puritans were, um, how we, what we mean when we say Puritan, uh, and how that impacts what Boston was. Um, then we're going to get into uh, kind of the final stages talking about how this vision of a Puritan city, um, a, a kind of a godly community, met the realities of colonialism. Um, these, the Puritans who arrived wanted to be morally upright, wanted a really uh, a community where people looked after each other, even though it was never kind of egalitarian, but they wanted to, they had a pretty lofty vision. But the reality is they uh, engage in stolen land, they had to figure out, or in stealing land, they had to figure out how to uh, um, make money. And so the interesting part of Boston in the first decades after its founding is how do these, how do these two kind of versions of Boston meet? These like really lofty aspirations and then the kind of muck that happens as people um, start trying to make a living and not, and not die. Um, all right. Um, so this is the first map of Boston um, that uh, is printed and survives. Um, there are a lot of ma maps in the 17th century of the harbor, which is not surprising since this is like how most people came and uh, the interest of a lot of people was not um, getting stuck on many of the islands. But this is actually from 1722. Um, so it's kind of hard to picture what early Boston looked like. But we can get a sense of this, of what the landscape looked like. And I don't know how many of you now from this class or previous, previously uh, have kind of been exposed to this idea that even the landmass of Boston, think getting back into the 17th century really requires a reorientation to uh, what the actual physical shape of Boston looked like. So if this map, um, you have to kind of tilt your head sideways. The north end is on the right. Um, this mill pond that's in the kind of top right is now where uh, TD Gardens are. Um, and uh, the, if you see Common there, that's of course Boston Common, and to the left of that is Back Bay, which is a bay. So it, was, uh, it looks like water there. A lot of Back Bay was actually kind of marshy, uh, salt flats, and um, actually someone said that, tidal flats. So um, this gives you a better sense there we go. Um, this is from uh, the Boston Public Library, the Leventhal Center. If you ever need maps of Boston, um, this is a c collection of uh, maps at Boston Public Library and they just have maps from every period of Boston and like most libraries are super keen to work with anyone who needs a map of anything. Um, I like this map because it gives you a sense of the Boston we're talking about, the Boston that was created in the 19th century and then what Boston looks like today. So the red map is what the landmass looked like when um, Europeans arrived to settle in 1630. Uh, a lot of what, actually what you guys are on now would have been this kind of tidal flat. Um, I'm over in Brookline right now, which uh, was, uh, was land. Um, so we're talking really about this peninsula that juts out into Boston Harbor when we talk about this early Boston. It's a weird shape of land, um, and it didn't really support that many people um, just on that land. Um, one of the interesting things about looking at this map is it is really relevant right now and going to get more relevant. This is a map of uh, expected sea level rise um, with climate change. 
Um, and one of the things you can see from this map is that the ocean uh, with the warming climates and melting glaciers wants to bring us back to this 1630s um, Boston because when landfill was created, uh, they didn't make it very high. So for example, when Back Bay was uh, filled in in the 19th century, it had to be one foot above the water at high tide. Um, Back Bay is going to be fine because it's in the Charles and there's uh, locks and dams and that sort of stuff that control the flow there. Um, but making and filling land meant that it was often like just above high tide a hundred years ago. Um, and so as we think about climate change, these what Boston looked like becomes newly relevant. Um, as you can see here, this is, I think, uh, three foot rise. Um, and this is what a flood would look like. And it is almost exactly what original Boston looked like. Um, so when you see these maps and you'll see them more and more, um, especially as Boston debates how to kind of mitigate the rising sea levels. There's talks about building a giant wall in the barrier islands. There's a talk of kind of building kind of zones that will be purposefully flooded. Um, but a lot of it kind of goes back to this natural land formation of what Boston looked like, um, because that's where the land is highest. Um, so before we get into what Boston looked like, who lived there, I also, what I said is I wanted to get into how the um, cities of, or the, the stories of cities are often told and kind of catch ourselves when we get into these well-worn narratives. Um, there's kind of uh, ruts we get into, um, genres um, and conventions we often get into when we talk about the beginning of a city. And in the US, uh, a lot of this was kind of started in the 19th century. There was a particular genre of city stories that explained how they emerged, um, that were typically celebrations of intrepid white men coming into a wilderness, making it their own, and uh, launching these places into modernity. Um, Boston was no exception. In, act in, in actual fact, a lot of these stories kind of focused on New England. Um, this was a pretty well-established, literate, they also had a lot of printing presses. Um, they liked, as Boston does now, likes telling stories about itself to other people and making them listen. Uh, so this was kind of inaugurated a particular way of talking about the, the birth of cities. Um, and in this case, uh, I, this is from a, a, a book about Boston in 1829. And I'm just going to read to you this uh, first paragraph. Boston, the metropolis of Massachusetts, contains about 70,000 inhabitants and is situated on a peninsula nearly three miles in length and a little over a mile in breadth of an uneven surface at the head of the Massachusetts Bay, north latitude of 42 degrees, 23. Uh, it was settled by Governor Winthrop and his associates in 1630 and received its name in honor of the Reverend John Cotton, who emigrated from Boston, Lincolnshire, England. England. The name was confirmed by an act of court September 7, 1630. Uh, OS just means like it, they, people marked calendars differently back then, um, which may be considered the date of the foundation of Boston. Its original Indian name was Shamit, and for a short time previous to receiving the present name, it was called Tri Mountain. Um, there are a lot of stories like this, um, and this is actually a pretty decent book. This is one of the only references to Native Americans that you will find in this book or books like this in the 19th century. And if you were to look uh, at a lot of books about like the, I don't know, tourism books, introductions to Boston today, it probably pretty similar. Um, there's this kind of collapsing of millions of years of history and his, so it, things kind of, the action starts with the arrival of intrepid jo Governor Winthrop and his associates. And what I find particularly interesting about a story like this, when they say the Indian name was Shamit, um, interestingly, I was really looking to try and tell you what Shamit meant. Um, and I found about 10 different versions, some referencing a gathering place, although the number of stories like this that say the Indian name meant gathering place. Um, uh, uh, I went to school in Toronto and that's also what the early histories of Toronto say Toronto meant. Um, but I, I actually, so I'm not going to present, present to you a, an authoritative version of what Shamit meant because I cannot find any sort of consensus about what Shamit meant in uh, the indigenous language. But anyways, um, 
there's a sense that Native Americans were here. They called it Shamit. Um, but there's an utter lack of curiosity in this book about both who these people were and presumably where they went. Um, he says its original Indian name was Shamit, but there are no other Indians in this book, leaving the question of who were they and where did they go? Um, and so I want to introduce you to this idea of uh, it's first thing and lasting. And, and a historian named Gene O'Brien um, introduced these terms in a book called First Thing and Lasting. And what she talks about this is what this sort of narrative does is naturalize extinction narratives of Native Americans. Um, and so think about 1829, this book was written. Um, this is in the same era as, for example, the Trail of Tears, the forced relocation of Native Americans to the West. We would get very quickly into genocidal wars against Native Americans um, on the plains. And so these narratives participate in a sense that this land was Native Americans, but now belongs to settlers. And so they often talk about these Native Americans at the beginning, but there's a sense that um, they are doomed to extinction. Oftentimes this is cast as a sort of a tragedy. These were noble figures, they welcomed aboard. You can think this is actually when you start getting the, first, the narrative of the first Thanksgiving and these sorts of stories. Um, Squanto shows up, Sacagawea, there are these, helpful natives who greet Europeans, often welcome them into these lands, but through no fault of Europeans, recede into the mist. Um, so these stories will often start with Native Americans, but then also kind of talk about the last Native American in the area, who is inevitably uh, an old, wise Native person who's friends with everyone and dies alone without um, issue. So the, the sense of these stories is that um, there's a sort of natural progression um, that the transition from native space to uh, a settler space is preordained either by God or by kind of a civilizational difference that uh, Native Americans cannot be part of this native or this 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 mo modern story modernity. Um, there's a lot of pictures you'll see of this era too, where you'll see these. Um, cities kind of leaping up with a lone canoe or something like that in the front as this kind of marker of uh, this clash. Um, so what it says is natives can't be part of this story. And this is just flat out false. We can actually find in Boston today, many people descended from uh, the Mass Massachusetts um, and Wampanoag communities who were the people who met um, settlers and who never left. Uh, uh, they have not had an easy couple of centuries, um, but they're still here and they still identify as indigenous. Um, they're still proud of their heritage and they're still willing, if we listen, to tell us different stories about this place. So as we get into this founding, this is what I want to think, I want to suggest is we have ways of thinking about how history is structured, how the narratives work. And it's easy to kind of unconsciously get into those um, ruts. But I want us, as we talk about the founding of Boston, to break out of that. So someone asks, is this, I know Simon, you said that uh, you would ask, is this the same concept as Manifest Destiny? So this is actually, um, it's very closely related, exactly. Um, this, I don't know how many of you know the picture of progress that's heading into the West. It's this, it's a really terrifying image of a giant woman carrying uh, electrical cable or uh, telegraph cables into the West and there she's chasing the buffalo and the natives away and there are uh, um, uh, trains chasing them away. Um, so this is the same era. Um, but because people had been in, because settlers had been in Boston for a long time, it had to be a sort of different story. Um, but this, this is an era that is really uh, Americans as they're kind of trying, this is still a, like think that the revolution was only a couple decades earlier. They're still trying to kind of make sense of who they are and why they should have this place. Um, so they are very invested in saying that they are the natural heirs of these Native Americans. So um, let's dispel this. Uh, a good place to start is um, thinking about the early contacts with the region that became uh, Boston. Um, what you have here is a picture of uh, kind of Boston Harbor, Cape Cod. Again, you have to turn your head to the right. Um, the Cape is at the bottom. Um, 
that bar. So north is to the right and south is to the left. And this is a map um, published, uh, drawn and published by Samuel de Champlain, um, who we don't often think of in uh, American history. He's actually the founder of Quebec. And so he's kind of a, he's the John Smith figure in Canada um, to some extent. He's like the, the intrepid European who founds a city, um, builds an empire, goes in and meets Native Americans, establishes trade. But they were actually, when the French arrived, um, they were really interested in this area. Um, it is, any of you who have spent um, winters in Quebec will uh, understand that it might not be your first choice um, when you come to North America. Um, so they actually thought about settling here. The reason they didn't was that it was so full of people um, and so full of people who were actually fairly resistant to Europeans. So this is a, a map of the area and you can see these are all pictures of cornfields and houses and people and there are people in canoes. This was a populated landscape. Uh, it's very difficult with any certainty to know the exact numbers of Native Americans in this period, um, but a good estimates are about between 70 to 100,000 people in southern New England um, at the time of contact. Um, well, at the time of settlement. Uh, figuring out when contact happened is actually also really quite tricky. Uh, throughout the 16th century, there were a lot of um, fishermen who came to this part of the world for cod and then went back to Europe, but increasingly they uh, engage in trade with Native Americans. And so what you find is stories of first contact where Native Americans seem really skittish, but not because they've never seen Europeans before, but because they have met Europeans and they tend to be people who kidnap them, kill them, uh, engage in dirty trade, this sort of stuff. And so there are these narratives that we can read and say, oh, they're scared of these giant ships. They think these Europeans are gods, this sort of stuff. But in actuality, these people had many, in many cases, a century of contact um, with people who, with Europeans who just didn't seem to be of the best moral character. Um, and so uh, they tried to keep their distance. They were standoffish, they attacked. Um, they did engage with trade because these people had access to metal goods and other things that these Native Americans wanted. Um, but uh, so when I say, early contact, usually by the time we have recorded contacts, um, interaction had been happening for quite some time. But this is what Samuel de Champlain says. Before reaching their wigwams, we entered a field planted with Indian corn. The corn was in flower and some five and a half feet in height. There was some less advanced, which they sow later. We saw an abundance of Brazilian beans. Um, they're not Brazilian, but the French had been in Brazil in the 16th century. So that kind of kind of tends to be the template um, they saw. Uh, um, of, of so anything they saw, they were like, oh, that's like they described in Brazil, um, which is seems kind of weird, but that's there's a lot of kind of Brazilian terms that are planted um, in this area. Uh, the first term for Jerusalem artichokes, which is actually, they're not from Jerusalem, they're actually indigenous to this area. Um, were, they were called them Tupinambur, um, which was named for the Tupinamb uh, Tupinamba people of Brazil, because they were kind of like a plant that the Tupinamba ate. They became Jerusalem artichokes because they are actually the, the tuber of a sunflower, but they went to Italy first, where they were called uh, girasol, and then they went to England, and in England, girasol became Jerusalem. Um, so they're, they're not Jerusalem artichokes. Um, anyways, but so this, the, the, for Europeans, this is also not first contact for them. They bring this knowledge of other places they had been to. So they describe Brazilian beans, squash, tobacco, roots, which they, the latter having a taste of an artichoke. This is what he describes as tupinambur. Um, the woods are full of oaks, nut trees, blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of people. Um, so the French decided to settle somewhere else. Um, in Quebec, uh, the St. Lawrence Valleys had been depopulated for reasons I can go into later uh, or in email. Um, and so it's easier to settle there. And they do. Um, the next kind of major description that also gives this image of a very populated place is uh, this by John Smith. John Smith we usually think of as a big figure in Virginia. Um, he actually coined the term New England. He was unceremoniously booted from Virginia. Uh, we don't know all the details, but it, or we don't know the details of, in, of his injury, but he, someone threw a lit bag of gunpowder in his lap um, and uh, his injuries forced him to leave. We don't know the details of 
the extent of the injuries, but we know that he never had kids. People um, don't do that to their friends in general. No. Um, so he was in England in the 16 teens. He had the reputation as someone who knew uh, these areas, had, had successful contact with Native Americans. And so people in Europe, in England, who were looking to settle nor, um, this part of the world, looked to him to kind of package a vision of what settlement like there could be. Um, so far, people who had went there had died in cold winters, been killed by Native Americans, and all of this tended to, let's say, depress people's interests in settling. So what did he decide that people liked? England. People liked England. So what should this area be called? New England. It's just like England, but new and better. Um, so John Smith called it New England. He described the region in 1614, and this is his description of uh, this area of what is now Massachusetts. Um, the next I came to, I can remember by name are Mattahunts, two pleasant isles of groves, gardens and cornfields, a league in the sea from Maine, then Totant, Massachusetts, uh, Pocahontas. Uh, I'm not going to pronounce a lot of these because they're not actually uh, correct versions of Native American names in any ways. But the reason I included this quote, again, is to say there were a lot of people here. This was not empty. This was not virgin soil. Um, you can see if we go into this map as a settler, uh, he, they actually called it the Massachusetts River. Um, but Charles, who was King of England at the time, had a better suggestion for the name of the river. Uh, which you understand. Um, so on these maps, again, you can see a lot of acknowledgement of native presence. These people knew that natives were there. They knew that settling there would mean interacting with these people. So who were these people? Um, if we're talking about Boston, we're talking about the Massachusetts people um, and to some extent the Wampanoag who they were closely allied and uh, uh, very culturally related to. Um, that's how you pronounce that term, Wampanoag. Um, it's a word that you probably will see around. They're most, they're now associated um, really with Cape Cod, um, which is where you'll find real extant communities, um, both there and um, Martha's Vineyard. Um, but this was kind of their turf. Um, uh, Wampanoag means kind of first people or uh, people of the first light, um, which was because this is where the sun would come up. Um, we don't actually know a ton about the Massachusetts, um, but they, we can talk about them as um, Algonquian peoples. Algonquian is uh, a linguistic grouping, so it's like saying um, Romance language or something like that. Um, these languages were a little bit more closely related than, say, Italian and French. They could be mutually comprehensible, um, but they, the farther you went away in um, Algonquian languages, so there were Algonquian languages in the Great Lakes, for example, and Wampanoag probably wouldn't be able to speak with them. Wampanoag could speak with Massachusetts, um, but it's again, a, it's a, a language grouping, but it also can speak to uh, uh, ways of describing these people. So when we talk about Southern New England Algonquian, we are talking about people who live in fairly large villages, uh, typically around a thousand, who moved seasonally but occupied the same territory. So these people weren't um, nomadic. What they would do is they uh, would, in the summers, um, live by these, uh, or the summers in different regions, live uh, along the coast and take advantage of the really rich resources. So think about the sort of resources you would have access to on the coast. You'd have fish, you'd have shellfish, uh, and then they would also supplement this with corn. Um, they didn't, because of this rich, um, these rich aquatic resources, they never went all in on corn to the same extent that, for example, uh, communities on the uh, Mississippi did, where you have these really concentrated, really agricultural. Um, they tended to kind of use corns, beans, squash, these uh, crops that were uh, arrived about a thousand years ago um, to supplement. So these were rich, varied, diverse, um, and fairly egalitarian. There are other parts of North America, Mexico, the Mississippi, where you have really quite stratified indigenous city, um, indigenous um, civilizations. Um, these tend to be not egalitarian um, in the sense that like everyone was equal, um, but egalitarian in the sense that they weren't really richly stratified in a way that like there weren't kings, there weren't emperors. Um, 
if you want to know more about the Massachusetts and Wampanoag that I'm able to talk about today, I'm happy to recommend resources. Uh, their history is important. Um, and uh, I think really we should know more about it in, uh, in Boston. Um, so where did these people in Boston in particular go? Uh, what I wanna introduce you to is the idea that this was not virgin territory, but there's a historian who said, this is not a virgin land, but a widowed land. Um, how was it widowed? Uh, between 1616 and 1619, a series of epidemics strike these people um, and uh, massive amounts of them die off. Um, this is a description um, by a sailor who travels to this region in 1619 named, Sa uh, named uh, Samuel Dermer. Um, and this is a, a printed version of his letter. Um, so there, between when... Um, John Smith was there, and when Dermer arrived in 1619, John Smith described peopled landscape, rich, dense villages, and in 1619, this is what he says. It was the 19th of May before I was fitted for my discovery, when from uh, Monahegan I set sail in an open pinnace of five ton for the island I told you of. I passed along to the coast where I found some ancient plantations, not long since populous, now, ver now utterly void. In other places, a remnant remains, but not free of sickness. Their disease, the plague, for we might perceive the sores of some that had escaped, who described the spots of such as usually die. When I arrived at my savage, uh, savage's native country, finding all, all dead, I traveled along uh, a day's journey westward to a place where finding inhabitants. So he actually, where he is, is uh, what became Plymouth. Um, uh, it was a native community called Patuxet. Um, that had been uh, richly settled, dense. Um, and when he talks about his um, uh, savages native country, this is actually the person, uh, this is Squanto, who many of you will probably know, knew English because he had been in England. Um, he had actually been taken prisoner by slave traders who tried to sell him in Spain. Uh, it was illegal to do that in Spain. Um, so he is redeemed and then sent to England. And from England, he tries to get on ships back to his home country. Um, and he returns in 1619. Uh, I'll talk, I, that's a great question. I will answer that in just one second. Um, but so he returns and he finds the community from which he came where he'd been kidnapped several years earlier, gone. And it's quite eerie for these people. There are fields of corn, um, a lot of like skeletons and bones and stuff they see, but up and down the East Coast, uh, these people are, are, are in large part dead. Estimates of mortality are between 50 and 90%. Um, because we don't have written sources and because um, of the nature of the descriptions, trying to figure out what this epidemic was is really hard. Um, there's a publication that came out in 2010 that I have on the left here. These are suggestions of all the different ways these people died. So there's uh, some people suggest a yellow fever, plague, influenza, smallpox, chickenpox, typhus. Um, this 2010 article actually suggested le leptospirosis, which is a disease that would have traveled with rats. Um, but there's already been critiques of that version. We don't actually know. We just know that the mortality was quite great. Uh, I'm just gonna actually share a quick video that um, my own thought on this is that if you can introduce native voices into this, you should. So I just have a quick video of my mouse disappeared. There it is. Um, no, that is not what I wanted. Can all of you see a screen that says the Pilgrims, European Plague, and Native New England? Okay, I'm just gonna play this, it's a couple yeah. minutes. In southeastern Massachusetts Bay, that's Wampanoag Territory. To the north of us was the Massachusetts, to the west was the Nipmuc, to the south was the Narragansett, the Pequot, Mohegan, Niantic. We estimate that within that area, we had about 69 villages. A village could be anywhere from 100 people to 2,000. 
So round it off at a thousand average, and you've got close to seventy thousand people. In sixteen sixteen, for the coming of the pilgrims, there was a huge plague started in Maine, brought over by European fishermen. It swept a fifteen mile wide path right down the coast sort of took a left through the middle of Wampanoag country and stopped at Narragansett Bay. The Wampanoags, and I think any other group that it hit, suffered anywhere from a 50 to a 90% loss in population. It happened so quickly. The means of death were so sudden and yet relentless. And English fishermen, explorers come to the coast and say, it's absolutely abandoned. It's devastated. Where did the people go? In some of the accounts, they found just bones bleached. Not because we didn't have rituals and observances, but because there wasn't anybody left to take care of the ones who had passed away. One villager named Tisquantum kidnapped two years before the plague began and carried off in chains to Europe, returned in 1619 to find his village completely abandoned. Tisquantum was fortunate along with others who had been kidnapped from Mopanag territory to make their way back home and to find the devastation that has occurred. It's unimaginable grief, the loss of that. And this is the world into which the pilgrims enter. It's very convenient for the telling of American history to start with the plague, to start with this massive death. But when those plagues happen, they are not as total as they appear. There are some areas that were virtually untouched by the plague. It was not so empty that it was ready to be reoccupied by someone from across the ocean. But when they arrived in this territory, they believed that their journey was ordained by God, that they had a mission that they were to fulfill, and the desolation that they found was God's providence. It was meant to be that way for them. Because the pilgrims have been so enshrined in the national imagination, because they've meant so much in what we've told ourselves about who we are as Americans, there's been a tremendous amount of memory, but there's also been a lot of forgetting. You know, that memory is very selective. We need to go back to look at what's been remembered and let that shed light on what's been forgotten. It's an important exercise when we're thinking about something that has been so central to our national imagination. So when we start talking about disease, what we can do is get into this sort of uh, the same mindset that the Puritans who arrived had. Uh, John Winthrop called these miraculous plagues and thought that this really was like the hand of God clearing this land. Um, but what I want us to consider is that this, the mortality from this is actually not that different, uh, for example, from the Black Death in Europe. And the Black Death uh, in Europe didn't clear the land away, um, didn't mean that Europeans went extinct. What we have to do is explain that the reason uh, Native American populations didn't recover, the reason Native American populations didn't kind of reclaim this territory was that at this time then Europeans arrived. But I don't want us because uh, we are talking about disease to again naturalize this, to say we can talk, acknowledge this history that the reason Europeans arrived and because they were successful in settling this part of uh, the world was because of disease. I don't want this to say that, again, natives had weaker immune systems, which is sometimes a version that is thrown around, or uh, couldn't adapt. Um, 
given time, they would have adapted. It just so happened that within a year or two of these just devastating epidemics, people who tended to say, oh great, this land is ours, uh, arrived um, and set up shop. Um, so, but this is the answer to what happened to the Massachusetts and why when in a, a decade later, uh, attention turned to settling what is now Boston, um, it was available for settlement. It wasn't kind of barging into native communities. Plymouth was, the, for example, set up on the site of a previous ex previously existing native community. Um, in many cases, Europeans actually sought these lands out because corn had already been sowed there. They knew the soil was good. They just had to brush away skulls to get there. So this is a different version than we have of, say, the first Thanksgiving or something where Native Americans are happy to have these people. They welcome them. They share the bounty. Um, instead, these are, in many cases, traumatized people uh, struggling to adapt to a real world, um, totally changed by disease, and trying to make sense of the fact that uh, this had happened to some indigenous communities and not others. So let's talk about um, the Puritans then and who they arrived or who they were. Um, a lot of you said that this was the term that you would use to describe colonial Boston, colonial Massachusetts. Um, I meant actually to not capitalize Puritan there. Um, uh, Daniel asked about, is this, is this a, I mean the story of the first Thanksgiving is false. Um, it is a story that is kind of comes to being in the 19th century uh, at this time where you're, Americans want to say that this was natural, that this was a good thing, that they were preordained to take this land. Um, we don't actually have a record of something like the first Thanksgiving. There is a, a celebratory meal um, that happens in 1621 that we can look back and say, this is the first Thanksgiving. Uh, it was celebratory because so many Europeans had died their first winter and this was their first harvest. Um, and when we know the context better, we understand that part of the reason the Wampanoags, who were the native participants in the first Thanksgiving, welcomed these uh, and celebrated with these people was because they had kind of sealed an alliance with the, the, the pilgrims because their traditional enemies, the Narragansetts to the West, had not suffered this population decline. So if you are in a long-standing feud with Native American communities to the West of you, and you lose 50% of your population, these people who show up with guns and metal um, armor and weapons are all of a sudden a lot more useful to you. So it's not that it's false. There is a meal that we can look at and say, uh, there was a celebratory meal, it happened in the fall, um, but the, the myth of the first Thanksgiving is the 19th century invention. So what I was gonna say about Puritans, um, historians tend to not capitalize Puritan anymore because by their very nature, Puritans are hard to kind of summarize as a group. Uh, what they tended to emphasize was local autonomy, um, by which I mean the autonomy of individual churches to kind of decide doctrine, decide practice, decide their own readings. They really believed that everything should be grounded in uh, um, strict observance of the Bible and religious practice should be fundamentally about sermon and kind of talking through what the Bible meant. But this meant that there were a lot of locally different characteristics. So it, we should be talking about um, Puritanism as uh, a really diverse religious orientation rather than like a codified thing. We can't talk about, for example, Puritans and Catholics as the same uh, um, because there's not like a codified central faith. This is um, from a, if you are interested in Puritanism and I find Purit Puritanism endlessly fascinating because it's so weird. Uh, this is a short book written by Francis Bremer, who's kind of one of the, like the historian of uh, Puritan New England. Um, he says, at the simplest level, Puritans were those who sought to reform themselves and their society by purifying their churches of the remnants of Roman Catholic teachings and practice then found in post-Reformation England during the mid 16th century, such as using clerical vestments. So, um, supplices, the, the traditional clothing um, that were worn in uh, uh, churches and kneeling to receive the Lord's Supper. They were particularly insistent that individual believers had access to the scriptures, the word of God in their own language. They agitated for the placement of university trained preachers in every parish. Um, this was because they really wanted uh, this, this sermon and this kind of explication and, and digging into the text was so important for them. They believe that England as a political nation must be committed to opposing the forces of Rome throughout Christendom. So they're sometimes called uh, as well separatists. They really tried to um, distance themselves from 
um, established churches, and were really against the establishment of anything that they uh, mitigated against this personal, more direct encounter with the Bible, which would mean standardized prayers, standardized songs, uh, the intervention of the state into how this should be, uh, how religion should be practiced. Um, so they were people who really thought that the Protestant Reformation had not gone far enough in England. Uh, this meant that they tended to not be the easiest people to coexist with. Um, everything I've read makes me believe that the Puritans uh, were not people I would want to hang out with. Um, they seem to have no problem telling each other, telling other people about their failings. Um, and in a Christian monarchy uh, that was grounded in the idea that uh, the monarch was the representative of God, um, this was a problem. If there were other people saying, well, we think God says this, sometimes they would actually also believe that God spoke to them. This tends to undermine a kind of top-down vision. Think about it like uh, um, today we have some of the same sort of fundamentally like epistemological, how do we know what we know problems. Um, if I can kind of come up with my own ideas about what science says and say, well, actually the science says this to scientists, we have a, a clash of knowledge. And this is what happens um, in the 16th and 17th century, um, where increasingly Puritans find themselves less and less uh, welcome in, in uh, uh, England at the time because of their conflicts with the crown and because of the conflict with um, religious uh, authorities, um, particularly Anglican bishops um, who were supposed to kind of be these hybrid civic religious authorities. Um, and when these people weren't listened to, it was seen to not just undermine religious authority, but civic authority. Um, so they, beginning in the um, for early parts of the 17th century, began to kind of look for places that they could practice their faith um, without the intervention of secular authorities. Um, you will, if you've not already, um, you will be reading A Model of Christian Charity by John Winthrop. Um, this is the text that says, that uses the phrase, uh, a city on a hill. It's worth not overemphasizing the importance of this text. This, was, this text was first published, I believe, in 1838, when it was found in manuscript form in Winthrop's papers by his family. Um, so it was not kind of a manifesto that was published in the 17th century as what Boston would be. But it gives you, the reason I suggest we read it is it gives you a sense of how the Puritans who arrived thought the society should work. Um, they believed in um, a sort of communitarian commonwealth ethos where people looked after each other. Um, they would be greater than some other parts. Um, but it also was a fairly strictly hierarchical um, society and really quite strict who belonged to churches, those who uh, practiced the right faith could be equal participants in this, um, but it didn't mean that they were going to all be the same class. Um, one of the things you'll see in this text as you read it is that there's a real attention to respecting uh, um, different levels in society. Uh, it's a struggle to kind of maintain this balance between everyone has equal access to God, everyone has equal access to the Bible, but slow down, some of us are better than others, and you should still listen to your elites. Um, and that's what you can kind of see working through Puritanism the, here. Um, so when we talk about the founding of Boston, it's really the 1620s to which we turn. Um, there had been these aborted efforts to settle in uh, New England earlier. There was a colony, for example, in what is now Maine in 1607. Um, it lasted one very cold winter. We still don't know what happened. Um, they were fighting and then all of a sudden the warehouse that stored the gunpowder exploded. Uh, that is the sort of thing that tended to happen to a lot of early European settlements. Um, people would fight, they pick fights with natives, a lot of them would die, uh, they home, lick their wounds, and they would try to colonize again in another decade or so. Um, the 1620s really picks up the pace in efforts to settle in uh, New England. And this brings in a lot of the figures that we will uh, start to know. So um, this starts in 1620 with the founding of Plymouth Colony. 
This is, these are the pilgrims um, that so many of us know who are actually in the sense of lowercase Puritanism, um, much stricter and quite different than the Puritans who would arrive in 1630 um, to settle Boston. They tend to be, um, they're from a different part of England, they're from kind of the middle. They tended to be lower class, um, lower middle class. Um, they tended to be more, they emphasized more of this communitarian um, influence. For example, they didn't have a lot of, uh, there was a lot more shared property, for example. Um, and they left England quite a bit earlier. They actually, um, I didn't write the year, um, uh, in 1609, I believe it is, they actually went to um, the Netherlands um, because they were, they resisted um, this uh, imposition of standard prayers, standard song, this sort of stuff. Um, so they went to the Netherlands, which was Protestant, promised some religious tolerance. Turns out that they didn't want so much religious tolerance as a place where their faith was uh, practiced and supreme. Um, and also the Netherlands at this point, because it had only recently become an independent state, um, and there were still hints that at any moment, the Netherlands, this is a whole other history, but had to kind of declared independence from uh, Spain. And they're actually, over the preceding decades, have been some fairly vicious wars um, in the Low Countries. But it looked like some of those might heat up again. And so in the 16 teens, um, the, the um, pilgrims who settled in uh, Leiden, led by William Bradford, decided to look elsewhere. They looked for a bunch of different places. They almost settled in Guiana, Virginia, um, and it actually looked like they were going to settle, they were in a Dutch uh, colony, and it actually looked like they were going to settle on the Hudson, um, where the Dutch were, at that point, beginning to settle New Netherland. So, um, they get permission to settle um, in, along, in along the Hudson from uh, a company in England. Um, they set sail. Uh, it is the first time their ship springs a leak and they have to go back. Then the second time their sails knocked down and they have to go back. Anyways, for people who really believe that God was active in the world, they didn't seem to take the hint. Uh, that they shouldn't be doing this, um, and just kept trying. Um, but in 1620, they finally arrived. They left so late in the year um, that they knew they were going to arrive at a t by kind of late in the season, and so they settled or tried to settle at the first land they found, um, which ended up being uh, Cape Cod um, near Provincetown. Um, they were already pretty sick. This was late in the year. Um, all they really managed to do was uh, piss off local natives by stealing winter storage of food, desecrating some graves because they thought they were kind of neat looking. Um, but Cape Cod still actually had a fairly, uh, um, was still fairly cold. Um, and so they were attacked by natives. They could see natives kind of, um, the words that Europeans often use was skulking, uh, which was, means to see they were being watched. Um, and this was because the Wampanoag at the time weren't quite sure what to do with these people. Uh, as I said, over the preceding decades, they, the Europeans who came tended to kill them, kidnap them. Um, so right, rightly, the Wampanoags kind of watched them to figure out what these people wanted. Um, in probably because the pilgrims had heard about this community uh, that had been at one point quite peopled um, but had been devastated by disease, they end up uprooting themselves and go going to what is now Plymouth and settling on the site of uh, an indigenous community. I'm not going to go into great detail about who the pilgrims were um, or they have a, a, a different history than Boston, um, but suffice to say uh, they were a fairly small group that did form a, an alliance with kind of the the paramount chief, um, they called him Massasoit, uh, which is actually more kind of a title than a name. His real name was Usumakin. Um, they, because they weren't, they formed alliances, they weren't that numerous, they didn't kind of upset the balance. And so they tended to have actually relatively good relations with Native Americans. Um, and after an initial winter where most of them, a lot of them died, um, they tended to uh, do quite well over the next decade. Um, but so this is one of the, the backdrops of when Boston has settled is this community that is kind of thriving and beginning to expand out from Plymouth. 
The second person worth knowing about settlement in New England in the 1620s is this man, Fernando uh, Gorches. Um, there's actually a uh, bay named after him in May. Maine, not May. Um, and uh, he couldn't really be more different. Um, he is a wealthy Anglican merchant from the west of England who is interested in uh, extracting wealth um, from New England, but staying in England. So he is interested in setting up a sort of um, feudal colony where there'd be essentially English lords sent over laborers um, who would work with them, extract ideally precious metals or furs or things that were uh, high value and low bulk that could be taken back to England. Um, they had a really difficult time recruiting people for this, this uh, planned feudal colony. Not too many people wanted to be serfs uh, in the New World. Um, so uh, after they tried to settle, as I said, in Maine, it lasted a winter. Um, they still had title to this land from the, from the crown. Um, they are actually the group that kind of gave the Plymouth uh, colony permission to settle in this area. Um, but they also try to settle an Anglican colony that is a bit more, um, that isn't sort of this like religious freedom, religious autonomy uh, at what is now Weymouth in 1623. Uh, the reason you don't really hear about this is it doesn't work. Uh, they, as in almost all these cases, um, upset natives don't think about planting corn, last a winter, and then go back to England with their, with their tail between their legs. The reason it's worth knowing about them is there's a couple figures in, in that stick around. They're Anglicans who went over with this colony, um, but they stick around and kind of settle on their own. And then when Boston is settled, they're in the backdrop. So when we're talking about the founding of Boston, what we're really talking about then is this Massachusetts Bay Company. Um, and this is a company as you would understand it. It is a joint stock company. This was uh, one of the crucial innovations in the 17th century that made colonization work. Um, one of the things in the 16th century that made colonization fail was it was often launched by the crown or a few wealthy individuals and they didn't have enough capital to kind of stick, stick through it when, stick through the first few rough years before they found uh, their footing or a valuable commodity. What joint stock companies did was they encouraged people with all sorts of levels of wealth to buy into these as an investment um, activity. Um, it meant that they had both more capital and they had a broader base of support. So there are more people who have investments in these companies. Therefore, there are more people who are interested in the colony doing well. So the Massachusetts Bay Company is not the only joint stock company, but it is one of them. Um, in 1629, it received a charter, which you will have read, um, from the Crown uh, that sets out both uh, their obligations to the Crown um, and the ideal kind of what this government would look like, um, but also the, the stretch of land. They tended to only kind of set upper and lower boundaries. So the Massachusetts Bay Company essentially is given permission to settle between the Charles and Cape Ann. Uh, and this was launched and led by uh, a group of wealthy Puritans who s didn't leave with the, the pilgrims, the separatists in the 1609, but increasingly saw over the 1620s that the tide against them and they wanted to leave. Um, getting these charters was not unique. What makes the Massachusetts Bay Company different than a lot of these other cases though, is that the people who led this company actually moved, in most cases, the base of these company would be London, Plymouth in Plymouth, England, um, these wealthy port cities. So the major players in this company actually brought their charter with them. Um, and that was important. The charter was this kind of, um, remember not everyone is literate. So you actually, these are usually richly ornate documents. They are actually physical symbols of royal authority granted to these people. So in 1629, they are given this fancy piece of paper on vellum that says Charles I has given us permission to settle here. They uh, set sail and arrive in 1630. The, the fleet they, are, they take um, over is 11 ships. It's about a thousand people. So already this is very different from the pilgrims who are a couple hundred uh, people, some mostly families, mostly middle and lower class. The people who are coming over in 1630 are elite. They tend to be merchants. Actually, a lot of them tend to be tailors. Um, they uh, are 
a different sort of people. These are not laborers. They are people. They are not farmers. Um, they are people who have a more kind of mercantile orientation to the world. So a fleet of eleven ships leaves in 1630. Um, they bring this charter uh, and this form of, you'll read this charter, it prescribes a certain form of government that again uh, gives you a sense of this kind of communitarian uh, ethos of what this, this is commonwealth where people would look after themselves or look after each other. Uh, they would meet four times a year, every freeman um, would write to partake, they would elect offices such as selectmen and governor annually. Um, it's not a democracy, but it's different than a lot of how these other companies were run. Um, and it's because there's a sense of a, like a, a community moving, run an extractive industry interested in getting gold or furs out. So Boston wasn't the first place that they thought to settle. Um, this is the first map um, etched printed in Massachusetts. It's actually done in 1665 although printed in the 1670s. Um, again, you, north is to the right, south is to the west. Um, you can see the cape on the bottom. Um, I give this to you because you can see two things, um, the kind of proliferation of communities. This is a couple decades after settlement and there are, you can see uh, Lynn, Salem, Cambridge, Woburn, uh, Weymouth. You can also see on the top uh, a recognition that indigenous peoples are still here. Um, and on the Cape. Um, you can see Narragansett, Pequot, uh, Cassett, um, these different indigenous communities. So uh, what you should take from this though is that Boston was not necessarily planned as the central settlement. Uh, uh, it's kind of accidental that Boston becomes the kind of de facto capital of this, of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. They originally in 1630 arrived at Salem. Um, there had been some initial settlement in 1629 uh, on Cape Ann. There was a trading post set up by uh, a man named Endicott. Endicott College is named after him, and you can see a statue of him by um, right by Northeastern, actually. Um, so he arrives in 1629 with some other folks and kind of sets up Salem for them. When the major, when the big fleet arrives in 1630, though, what they find is a lot of people who've starved over the winter. Um, they aren't particularly keen to stay. We don't have all the details. The deputy governor, um, Dudley, uh, what is now Nubian Station, the used to be Dudley Station, is named after this deputy governor, Dudley. Um, all he says is that it pleased us not. So they decided to keep going. Where they went next um, was what became uh, Charlestown. So they went there, this, they moved into uh, Boston Harbor and settled there in the middle of the summer. Uh, it was not a happy settlement. Um, they didn't have access to great water. And so there is dysentery, they're scurvy because they're still relying most food they brought with them and not fresh food. Uh, and some of the major, um, the wealthiest, most elite people actually die that summer and so they for whatever reason decide not to stay there um, where they decide to move um, at least initially from uh, here is to the peninsula that they call Shamet um, or the natives call Shamet and they call as uh, we saw at the beginning um, Tri Mountain they call it Tri Mountain because we tend to think I think of Boston is reasonably flat right now um, but when they arrived at Boston what they saw were three giant hills. Um, uh, Beacon Hill is the only one that really remains, but Beacon was the tallest of three hills, um, actually mountains. Beacon Hill was uh, 150 feet high um, from the shore and they kind of moved into, uh, dropped along cliffs right to the water. So they called this area Tri Mountain. Um, if you're wondering where they went, they became the back bay in the 19th century when there's interest in making more land. Um, they decide that they can do, kill two birds with one stone by leveling out these hills. They can make Beacon Hill more settleable and they can make Back Bay settle, settleable by filling, by using the land they make from leveling out these hills, uh, moving it into the, the bay. Um, but so they call this Tri Mountain um, or uh, Shaman. Uh, the reason they come here is that there is an Anglican, Anglican, Anglican minister named Blackstone or, or Blackston you can see at the top of the map there, it says Blackstone's Point. Uh, uh, 
the reason I brought up the settlement at Weymouth in 1623 was that one of the people who had kind of come, this was an Anglican uh, settlement, and Blackstone had come um, with and uh, relocated to the Shawmut Peninsula um, and had done quite well for himself. Um, he is already in the Boston Harbor, and so the Puritans reach out to him. He seems pretty happy to live and work with these people. He actually knows some of them from England. Um, and he says that there's a really good water source on the peninsula. Um, and so that's where the, um, the next spot that the Puritans um, settle. The water, the source of the water is, if you're looking at this map on the right, um, you'll see uh, Bendel's Cove. Um, that's where the Puritans really settle down. And that's where the um, source of water is best at the kind of bottom of the, the, um, the hill there, the three mountains. And this is where I originally tried to send some of my students to see this plaque that marked, there was the Great Spring, which for more than two centuries gave water to the people of Boston. Um, and this is kind of uh, explains the early geography of the city. This is where Winthrop and a lot of the elite settled, right, kind of in this cove, um, right by the spring, which became now where the state house, the state house is. So this was kind of where the, the locus of uh, early settlement was. It was also where they chose because Blackstone still lived on the northern end, or sorry, the western end of the peninsula in what is now Beacon Hill. Original, or eventually Blackstone gives the rest of his land to the colony um, and that becomes uh, the common. Um, uh, Boston Common starts as this kind of big meadow, part salt, part, um, part, part salt marsh, part actual meadow um, that the colonists used to kind of or hold in common and um, uh, feed their cows, hang their convicted prisoners, that sort of stuff. Um, Jacob asks, yes, Winthrop, I'm about to get to him um, right now, actually. Um, if you can see, so you'll see there's field near Colburns um, on the bit of the map. And if you look just to the right of it, you'll see two little rivers going into uh, what look like little lakes or little ponds. The one on the right there is actually, even at this early moment, was called Frog Pond. Um, so if you ever go skating on the common, that's what's left over from this little thing. It used to actually be uh, a tidal pond, um, but then as land was built out, um, it got filled in and it kind of became this isolated thing. But if you ever go to Frog Pond, it has these roots. So um, the person who would have been the, essentially the leader of the colony, his name was Isaac Johnston, died um, in Charleston in the summer. And this meant that the man who became uh, the kind of de facto leader of the colony, John Winthrop, the kind of second most prestigious person, uh, when they moved to Boston proper, um, was elected and named governor. Um, and it was his location in, uh, on the peninsula that kind of made it the capital. There were a lot of other suggestions for where folks should settle. Um, Dudley, for example, really thought that they should settle uh, to the west. This, uh, he suggested what became Watertown, um, and then he suggested another location um, that they called Newtown, that when a couple years later Harvard was founded, they named after the university city in Europe, Cambridge. Um, so he suggested both Cambridge and Watertown. Um, but because the folks had started actually kind of building their houses, because Winthrop had already started kind of holding court um, on the Shawmut Peninsula, it kind of uh, uh, gathered a certain sort of gravity. Um, and Boston, which they renamed when as uh, John Cotton, their first minister, arrived. Um, no, Newtown actually became uh, Cambridge. Uh, they weren't always the most original, namer, uh, original namers. And so once Cambridge became Cambridge, and another town was founded, it became the Newtown. Um, but New, Newtown, so Newtown was, became Newton at some point, but uh, the Newtown that I'm talking about became Cambridge. So um, by 1631, it was pretty clear that Boston was going to be the capital of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, um, they started actually building uh, houses, um, they started building uh, roads, they started kind of settling in. This map is, you'll, is a, a reconstruction of what it would have looked like at the end of their first year. And you can see how they're orienting themselves. The densest part of settlement is, as I say, at the foot of the hill by the spring, but there's some movement out towards what becomes the north end. There's a road south to connect it to what becomes uh, the south end and um, uh, Roxbury. 
Um, there was also a settlement of other Puritans at this time to the south of here um, at an area the natives called Mattapan or that the, the settlers called Dorchester because they left from Dorchester. So by 1630 there and 1631, there's a bunch of different like embryonic settlements around this area. And it's not ordained that Boston becomes the capital, um, but because it's where they settled, because it seems pretty healthy, um, it becomes the capital. It, was not necessarily where people would have, if you had given people a list of criteria um, to look for as where you should settle a colony, it didn't really scratch too many of those uh, or tick too many of those boxes. It didn't have lots of arable soil. It had hardly any trees. Um, and these are both uh, two of the things that um, colonies really depended on in those early years. In, um, within a couple of years, there was actually talk about abandoning Boston because it had so little wood. Um, and you can imagine if you're living in hand-built houses in Boston winter, um, that you would go through a lot of wood. And so there's actually talk about abandoning it because if they can't keep themselves warm. Um, what it did have though, as I said, is abundant water. And because it didn't really have these woods, it didn't really have um, arable soil, what it was also good because of what it didn't have. There's a text from 1636 that say the principal advantages of Boston is that it didn't have wolves, mosquitoes, or rattlesnakes, which apparently were, uh, there were a lot of them in other parts. Um, so it was, it might not have been the easiest, but it was comfortable. And the people who settled in Boston tended to be the most elite Puritans. These are the people who had invested the most heavily in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And so these were also people who could afford um, and had the prestige to have food, wood, these sorts of necessities brought to them. Um, what it also really meant though, was that it became very quickly more trade oriented than say agricultural. Um, it was kind of Atlantic focused. These people weren't focused on farming. Um, it meant that this was kind of the more Atlantic facing and therefore more um, trade oriented. And over the next decade, um, as a lot of other Puritans follow, um, this is what historians call uh, the Great Migration. Um, this kind of becomes the, the base through which the other um, settlers fo uh, follow. And it's in this place that a lot of the things that these people will need, food, animals, uh, sold to them. So there's a dis it wasn't ordained that Boston would be capital, uh, the capital, but in settling there, they kind of gave a, a, a trade orientation to the colony. Um, but what I just want, as we wrap up our time, what I just want to hint at is what this trade orientation meant, the vision that Winthrop gives in uh, his uh, sermon, uh, A Model of Christian Charity. Here in the Model of Christian Charity, he suggests that what this colony will look like is a commonwealth um, where people will look after themselves. It will be a model um, for the world of um, what a godly city will look like. But the orientation towards trade meant that they were um, more expansive um, and got into more conflict because of the trade early on. I'll give two examples of this. So one is um, the example of Robert Keane. Robert Keane was a quite wealthy merchant, but also a very committed Puritan um, who arrived in uh, 1635. Um, and he is worth knowing because he, his example shows how the Puritans tried to juggle the impulse to trade with their Puritan uh, um, impulses and this insistence on um, uh, looking after each other and being godly. So there was kind of, there was no set limit on how much profit folks could make um, on trade, but he is someone that in uh, 1639 is actually brought before the court and the church for making too much um, on nails that he sells to these new arrivals. And he is actually forced to pay a fine and he is actually forced to publicly apologize uh, to the church that he is part of, the first church. Um, and in, eventually, um, as his, he continues to be kind of dragged for uh, his success at trade, what he does is give up a bit of his land. He was quite wealthy and a, a principal investor in the Massachusetts Bay Company. So he's given this 
chunk of land right in the center. And the land that he gives up becomes what is called at the time the first townhouse. It becomes the kind of the base of it is a, a market and the top is where a lot of the civil government happens. And this is the land that becomes um, the old state house. But it was given up because this guy made too much money in trade. Um, and so there is this real balancing act between how do we be Puritan, but how do we make sure Boston thrives? So if you see um, his, what the state house is, it's born of this kind of tension between being Puritan and Boston thriving. The other example that I have um, is this tension between being uh, godly um, and making money by engaging in Atlantic trade. Um, this is a quote from a text um, from 1636. I'll just go read it quickly. The 2nd of October, about nine uh, of the clock in the morning, Mr. Mavericks, Negro woman came to my chamber I actually can't read this because the Zoom thing isn't there. Um, you can read it because uh, the Zoom screen is kind of blocking out my... Um, suffice to say, this is a man who came to visit uh, um, uh, Samuel Maverick, who lived on land that is now Logan Airport. He, owned an he lived on an island came not called Noddles Island. Um, and what he saw was um, an enslaved African woman um, pleading for help. And she was pleading for help because Maverick had plans to have his two... Um, male African uh, slaves effectively rape this woman um, to produce children that he would then sell as slaves himself. The orientation towards trade meant that what Boston um, very quickly got involved in was the Atlantic slave trade and slave trade, particularly in the Caribbean. Um, and although there were never as many slaves in Boston as there would be in other colonies in the Caribbean, in the American South, Boston does become involved in the slave trade quite quickly. Uh, the first slaves arrived um, in uh, Boston probably in 1638. This is where these people um, probably came. We don't know. We don't even know this woman's name. Um, but I signal this just at the end of this to um, suggest to you that the history of Boston as unfolds is this tension between these kind of um, lofty Puritan visions of what a place where everyone looked after each other would look like. Um, and the realities of a colony that was built on trade with the Atlantic, which meant increasingly the slave trade or trade in goods that were produced by slaves and violence against Native Americans. So um, as you go forward in this class, think about how you juggle these two tensions. And don't just think about the city on the hill as what Boston was. When you hear these kind of lofty, we were built as like Puritans, they were so good, they took care of each other. Boston unfolds as this fundamental tension between these impulses a desire to be godly and a desire to be rich. And I'll end on that because I know um, we're done. Um, and you. let you know that if you have any questions, you can email me here. Thank you so much, Professor Parsons. It was awesome. I am going to email out Professor Parsons trivia question to oh, yes. win this. And we have, he's given us so much to talk, to talk about in our uh, discussion sections on Fridays, which I really appreciate it. Um, and we will, and I will send, be sending out the schedule for that uh, later today as well as some other goodies. So thank you so much. Don't be shy if I can ever help. And look at all those thank yous coming in on the chat. See, and take a class with Professor Parsons. That's that's the best thing. And thanks for the questions uh, in the chat. By the way, everybody asked really really good questions. Uh, who put it in there worked worked really great. So thank you. All right, thank you guys. And you're free to go. <laughs> Bye guys. Thanks a lot.